Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Marika Shores, who is a lyric mezzo singer who lives in uh, Eugene, Oregon. She is uh, uh, active in performing opera, and she also at various institutions in that area, um, including the Eugene Opera, the Cascadia Concert Opera, the Willamette, I don't know how to pronounce that, but Willematic, maybe, concert opera. And um, she also uh, is a jazz singer, and she also teaches uh, singers and also presenters, people who want to improve their public uh, speaking skills. She is also a licensed uh, body mapping educator. Body mapping is a kind of an offshoot of the Alexander Technique developed by Bill and Barbara Conable. And she is also currently training to become an Alexander Technique teacher with Kathy Madden, uh, a teacher in Seattle, Washington. Marika, welcome to the show. Thanks, Robert. Good Mar to be here. Good to have you on the show today. Marika, what do you say to people when they ask you what the Alexander Technique is? Um, the first thing I probably would say is that it's an it's a learning process. It's a um, it's a refining of the learning process for any individual, which gets applied to whatever they want to learn. So, if they're learning how to sing, for instance, then um, understanding Alexander technique helps them to to learn to sing more easily. Um, specifically, the Alexander technique is about the, the relationship between the head and the spine and the relationship indeed of the mind to the body and how it interacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it does have um, a fairly long history, about 120 years, I guess, at this point. And indeed. I suppose of all of the um, performing arts fields, I think it is best known um, among musicians in general. Um, how how did you um, well how did you come to it and and how is it affect how has it impacted your own singing and performance skills? I think I first had an introduction to the Alexander technique when we had a, a speaker come in when I was at the University of California Irvine back in my undergrad and graduate days, but then it was just a little hint, a little touch of it, and I went, oh, that's interesting, and I didn't really pursue it further, and then I graduated and I started teaching. California up here to um, Eugene, Oregon, and um, I started having some vocal trouble and issues that I couldn't quite pin down or understand, so um, I went to a Voice Care Network, which is an organization that does summer workshops, mm -hmm. and I met Alice Pryor, and she, of course, is a marvelous Alexander Technique teacher, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, there's something really here, because suddenly the issues that I was having started to resolve themselves, and I, and I realized there was, a whole, there was a whole learning field that was tremendous that I had no clue about, and I knew immediately that it would enhance my own teaching. So I started to pursue it. I went back to Voice Care Network several summers in a row. I went over to Austin, Texas, and I worked with um, Alice and George over in Austin, and then I found out that Barbara Conable had just moved to Portland, Oregon to be with her family a little bit more. So I immediately contacted her and began a three-year process of going to see her once a month um, and training with her, initially not necessarily to specifically be a body mapping person, but um, more just for my own for my own learning process. Mm -hmm. And I attended workshop after workshop with her, and then I also did one-on-one -on -one sessions with her for quite a while. And then at the end of it, she's like, well, you might as well be a body mapping <laughs> person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you spent all the time on it. So I said, okay. And then, um, so I was developing that for a while, and then um, Barbara, Con Barbara kind of retired, and I have my own, of course, I was taking all this information and applying it into my studio, as well as my singing. Um, and Cantari Voice Studio 
found its own niche with the body mapping as an addition to, to just the straight um, singing training. The adv huge advantage it gave me is it gave me a vocabulary to be able to teach classical singing technique to non-classical singers. So I became known as a commercial studio. Mm. So I have, I have, um, I have musical theater singers. I have jazz singers. I have pop singers. I have a, a bluegrass singer right now. I have this really wild variety of I have actors that come in. I have public presenters that come in. Mm -hmm. So it's broadened the scope of of what um, what my my studio can address and who it can address. And it gave me mm -hmm. this vocabulary, like I said. And then um, I like to keep my learning process going because I feel like it feeds me and it feeds the studio and it feeds my students. Um, and I'm a sucker for learning. I just it's just my thing. So uh, then I found Kathy Madden and I talked to her and said, I'd like to come up, figure out how I can come up to Seattle on a regular basis and train with you. And she said, great. So that's been the process for the last few years. So there's mm -hmm. been quite a, you know, since the 80s, I've been doing this on and off. Mm -hmm. So w what um, what is it that you would say you bring to, let's say a singer comes to you for voice lessons Mm -hmm. vocal lessons what is it that you can bring to the mix from from your alexander work that um a, a, i hate to say regular but an or like a, a typical vocal teacher might not be able to bring what, what's well, what's the unique factor that you've mm -hmm. you can bring to bear from your alexander studies well the first lesson always we sit down and we look at skeletons and anatomy books and we talk about the structure of breathing and the structure of balance and um, we explore a little bit um, how breathing works with the appropriate sort of body mapping picture in place in their minds and we correct any um, uh, misunderstandings of how their body works and almost every new singer comes in with some misunderstandings. And by misunderstandings, um, you're, you're thinking of things like where the diaphragm is or how the ribs function or exactly. that sort of thing. And, and I, I think one of Barbara Conable's, um, well, I guess it was Bill who originally discovered this, but Bill and Barbara's Conable, uh, Conable's discoveries is, is that just getting that information across to someone in a very concrete way can make a huge difference in how they function. And I think Barbara has actually got kind of a, a law of human movement, which is something like if there's a divergence between what you think is going on in terms of the reality of where a joint is or how it functions and the actual physical reality of it the one that's going to win that fight is your notion that is you're going to attempt to move as though the joint or was where you th thought it was and of course if that's not the actual location you're going to get a, a great deal of extra strain and, and tension in your body so um, I mean would you see it that way or do you have a different take on on that process Oh, no, absolutely. That's a kind of a good, really good basic guiding principle. She calls it the integrity of the body map is, yeah. I think, her little, her little catchphrase on it. Right. And um, basically, your mental picture in your mind of your body, which is um, related to you from your kinesthetic process, is your mental body map. And it can be accurate or it can be inaccurate in various ways. And mm -hmm. the more accurate it is, the better the better naturally functioning you are. And I've seen really instantaneous results. I've seen the look of, oh, that's like that, and watched right, instant changes right. in people without any further, even if we don't do any exploration of movement um, or, you know, take it. You know, in other words, sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes the exploration using some movement or, or guiding principles needs to happen when, when, when the, just the change of the body map alone doesn't clarify it. Right, right. But just, as you say, just getting that map sorted out, which can be a very simple process. It's not yeah, a, a amazingly. difficult one. I, I think of it as kind of applied. I, I think of it as kindergarten anatomy applied to yourself. <laughs> I mean, any kindergarten kid could get any of these concepts. They're not, they're not difficult. Um, 
uh, and um, just just that knowledge, as you say, of where a joint is or how it functions on yourself can just open up a world of possibilities even without any Alexander work. Um, so obviously that's something that you bring to your work that many vocal teachers would not have at their disposal. Correct. Yeah. And the other thing, of course, that you're now bringing, I assume, is some more, I guess we could call it classical Alexander thinking. How how would you say that um, dovetails with, with the body mapping process? Uh, boy, that's a good question, Robert, especially because I'm still in this particular process of the, the training for Alexander technique. Um, Kathy... Um, her, her her concepts and her awareness are f- absolutely amazing, Kathy Madden's. Mm-hmm. More than anything else, I understand from her some of the underlying principles and concepts of Alexander Technique, like the, the mind-body relationship and interaction and... Um, and the relationship of the natural the natural integrous movement of the entire body related to any one specific activity of the body, be it deep breathing and singing or be it playing an instrument or anything right mm-hmm. the body the body collects together to support whatever the activity is, and in specific the the skull spine relationship and the balance through the spine and through the the skeletal structure. Um, and the way that how you how you initiate a thought then responds in the body and not getting in the way of that process, understanding that process and not getting in the way of it. Those are some of the things I've been really picking up with Kathy mm-hmm. and her learning, her learning, pro- her teaching process, which is phenomenal. And, and, I, and, and I would I would add that a, a lot of what informed, I'm sure, informs Kathy's teaching comes from the late Marjorie Barstow, who was mm-hmm. the first person to formally trained with Alexander back in the early 30s, um, an incredible teacher who lived here in Lincoln, Nebraska for, for many years. And I think when you, when you, you talk about the mind-body connection and so on, I mean, that is, that's something that Alexander came to um, uh, from direct experience, uh, working on himself, trying to deal, in fact, with a, a vocal issue. Uh, he he didn't he was not a philosopher a, at all by nature he was he was uh and he was living in a in a part of the world in a time when ideas of mind body integration just were not in the air to put it mildly and and he came upon it simply by self observation and self experimentation mm-hmm. he had a need and he which had was... a need and out exactly. of that came some understanding of human movement um, and how our thinking, how the way we think about ourselves uh, affects the actual movements we make. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing I think is interesting is it was at a time where in the West those ideas were not really out there very much anywhere and certainly not in rural Tasmania in 1890. Uh, that was definitely not in the air. So, yeah, so those are, those are things that, that you, can, you can bring uh, to, um, t- to working on yourself or working with a student. Um, would you, uh, my sense uh, from having worked with singers over the years and singing teachers is that good singing teachers see a lot of the things that an Alexander teacher might see, but don't have exactly the most useful tools to deal with it. For example, I think a lot of singers, singing teachers, will see that a student uh, is is tightening their neck or pulling their head back on their neck sometimes when they sing. And of course, that obviously isn't going to help their vocal production. But often the solution proposed is something like, well, drop your chin. I'm sure you've heard that phrase. Right? <laughs> oh, yes. And, uh, of course, from an Alexander Technique perspective, that's really not the way to go. Could you say a word or two about maybe that example or just that that issue in general? Well, if somebody, um, if somebody is tightening their head-neck relationship, 
mm-hmm. in singing, right? Yeah. The first thing is to restore that or get in the way of that that tightening and see what other systems respond. That can be that can be one direction of starting is, is um or to bring awareness, the students' awareness to what's going on. But that that by itself might not be um uh, the perfect solution. I have to say that that if I see something like that, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to say this would be my one course of action because it kind of depends on what I know about about the student. Sure. Um, mostly, I think I would start with their their overall body balance, mm-hmm. and um, seek to restore that with conversation and with um, some guidance and some movement mm-hmm. and some be- beginning discussion and see how much restoring um, the beginnings of the restoring of the entire body balance then relates back to the head, um, the head spine relationship. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, my- but really, I mean, ultimately what you'd like to see happen is for a student to stop tensing their neck and telling someone to, say drop their chin isn't isn't likely to do that no no and and i wouldn't ask them to drop their chin yeah. i wouldn't even address it as a chin right, issue right but i'm saying that is something that i hear a lot uh, sure and, sure that's but that's treating a symptom rather than right. the issue yeah and i'm just saying that's something that i think may be a key thing that distinguishes the alexander work from from maybe most other um, processes out there that have similar uh, ultimate goals mm-hmm. is that we we tend to be, I think the general philosophy is find out what the student is doing that's getting in the way and help them to stop doing it. And mm-hmm. then um, out of that is very likely to come um, a quality of posture and movement that's going to be a lot easier. Whereas a typical other method approach might be, well, they're doing something that's not useful. Let's give them something else to do to counter it. Right. And that, just... and that is not a good idea, at least in Alexander, you know, from an Alexander point of view, that is not a very good idea <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> I mean, no, would you, would like you agree? With, would you would you agree with that? I just yep. yeah, yeah, yeah and I think that's a key element about the technique that really that really distinguishes it from from other things. And there can be multiple things that a student is doing that's getting in the way of the natural process. Mm-hmm. And then you're you go on this little search with the student because one might be the initiatory, right? It, you know, issue, and then there might be a host of oh, secondary there. issues. <laughs> There, there are many layers in the human oh, yes. onion. Yeah, exactly. I, I, before we come to an end, I'd like to just touch a little bit on your work with uh, presenters and people who have to um, have to do public speaking. I've, sure. I've read that uh, among Americans, anyway, the thing that most people fear the most is getting up in front of a group and speaking. And I'm sure you've run into that. And I wonder if you could say a word or two about how your training as body mapper and also Alexander teacher uh, can can help with that. Uh, you mean you're talking about like uh, stage, stage fright. fright. <laughs> <laughs> the big stage right. fright. That, that yeah. actually came up this weekend in a discussion. Somebody asked about it. Mm-hmm. which was marvelous. We were having a body mapping workshop here at my, my studio. Mm-hmm. And and somebody asked about it. And we had already gone around. We had, It was the end of the workshop. And we had um, we had talked about the mind-body connection. And, we'd, and we, we happened to have in the group a psychologist who came that day and also a psychology um, undergrad who was finishing up. She was in her senior year. So they had all their background. And so we began this round robin discussion. Mm-hmm. And we and I had just read I read Missy Vineyard's book. I, you, mm-hmm. you know Missy, sure. right? Yep. And I, mm-hmm. I loved some of her concepts. I found mm-hmm. them very helpful and clear and mm-hmm. um It's the best introductory book out there for sure. I would have totally agree. Missy yeah. Vineyard's what is it? How you stand, how you move. It's a tediously long title. <laughs> but um I can never remember <laughs> the the main title is something like how you stand, how you sit, how you move. And then exactly. 
just the basic precepts and how she lays them out are marvelous. Yeah, very nicely done. But she yes. has this wonderful section about um, the biology of feelings, mm-hmm. and she has this wonderful section about, she's got a beautiful, clear section on the kinesthesia, mm-hmm. how first there's the physical sensation, and then there's an, our interpretation of the physical sensation, and then there's our judgment upon our interpretation of the physical sensation, you know, and... Um, um, so this is the long answer and then there's a short answer too. But um, so we talked through that, which everybody found very helpful. I said, remember, it's your interpretation of the physical sensations that are happening right before or right as you get onto stage mm-hmm. that are tripping you up because you're interpreting them as fear when you could interpret them as excitement. Mm-hmm. But the fact is, is that there are physical sensations in play. Usually there's some adrenaline going on, right? Those, that's the physical part of it. And it can enhance a performance or it can smash, you know, I, we did, did the analogy of body surfing in California, right? Mm-hmm. The wave can smash you or you can ride it all the way into shore right. depending on how you p- right. place yourself. How you approach it. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then the, the, the short physical answer that we kind of came up with was um, to if you're if you're about ready to go on stage and you're nervous, one of the things that the adrenaline in your system um, tends to lock up is your breathing. So to keep breathing or to do um, some kind of ordered breathing a little bit, mm-hmm. and to be mindful that that is that that is part of your body's physiological response to adrenaline in your system, can can help um, kind of minimize the effects on yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, the you know, so that's the physical aspect. And then the rest of it is really a psychological aspect of mm-hmm. how you perceive your audience. Right. Mm-hmm. And how you perceive mm-hmm. your relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Does, does that answer? Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, ba- right. basically, if, if nothing else, you can you can show someone to you can help someone notice the phys- their physical reaction that they can cont- that potentially they can control i don't mm-hmm. think most people are going to be that good at controlling their a- adrenaline but you can certainly no, you certainly uh if you if you um realize w- exactly what you do in anticipation of speaking in front of a group typically it's going to involve some tensing up somewhere, certainly very likely in the neck and face, but could be, you know, your breathing might might be affected as well. And if you can address that, uh, then that's going to make a huge difference in how you approach this project of speaking in front of a group. One time I was working with Barbara Conable in a workshop and I was nervous. I got up to sing and she said, she suddenly stopped me and she said, what are you what are you thinking of right now? What's in your attention? I said, all I can think about is how nervous I am. Right. And she said, okay. Um, and she took me through this process of, of okay, um, become aware of the room, become aware of what's outside the room, become aware of, of the whole town around you. So she took my attention. My attention had sort of zoomed into my, my fear and my nervousness. Mm-hmm. So she mentally stepped me back out into a broader picture. Mm-hmm. And then she said, now you, the fear is still there. The physical response is still there. But you can sort of encapsulate it off to the side a little bit so it doesn't like balloon up and overwhelm your awareness, mm-hmm. which is a lesson I've never forgotten. Mm-hmm. And I try and import, impart whenever I have this conversation with, with a singer or a presenter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, unless there's something else that we haven't covered that you'd like to add, this might be a good place to end the conversation. Anything that you, maybe you could tell us the name of your studio. I didn't mention that at the beginning. Oh, thank in, you. It's in Eugene, right? Eugene, Oregon. It is in Eugene. It's called Cantari Voice Studio. And okay. the website is www.cantarivoicestudio.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we'll put a link to that by the interview as well. Okay. And, uh, anything you want to add that we haven't touched on? Gosh, Robert, I'm, I, it seems to have been pretty broad and expensive. We did it. A lovely conversation. <laughs> yeah. we, we did it. Well, uh, my, my guest today has been Marika Shores, who is a singer uh, and a teacher of singers in uh, Eugene, Oregon. We'll put a link to her website by the conversation. If And she is in the process of becoming, she's a, a licensed body mapping educator and she's 
in the process of becoming a teacher of the Alexander Technique. If anything that we've been talking about uh, interests you and you live in anywhere near Eugene, give uh, contact her through her website. And if you live anywhere else in the world, we'll put a link to a website where you can find an Alexander teacher uh, in your area. Marika, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, you're welcome, Robert.